Lord sent my Savior to die in my place. Why should he love me so? Meekly to Calvary's cross was he led. Why should he love me so? Why should he love me so? Why should he love me so? Why should my Savior to Calvary go? Why should he love me so? Nails pierce his hands and his feet for my sin. Why should he love me so? He suffered sore my salvation to win. Why should he love me so? Why should he love me so? Why should he love me so? Why should my Savior do Calvary go? Why should he love me so? a great privilege to look into God's word and see the incredible things that he has revealed to us there. As we compare Old Testament with New Testament, there are new wonders that God gives to us every time we look in. It's like looking into a, a magnificent shop in which there are all kinds of beautiful things in the window and every time we look, the display changes and yet is the same and moves and has uh, all kinds of reflections of light and all kinds of beauty and glory and value. But the Word of God is so much more precious even than the temporal things that we imagine in all of their beauty. And part of that is as we compare the Old Testament tabernacle with the person and work of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's been a very brief, actually, but perhaps seem the extended study of the tabernacle. We hope to cover the final part tonight. I'm not sure we'll make it all the way through. There may be a part two to the Ark of the Covenant, which is the final object or instrument of worship inside the tabernacle itself as we have looked at each of the pieces of furnishings there. And yet the Ark of the Covenant gives to us the most beautiful focus on our Lord Jesus Christ and his finished work of all of the different articles that are found inside the tabernacle. We're actually in the New Testament, but reference was made back to the tabernacle by Stephen in his sermon in Acts chapter 7. You know, he's on trial for his life, and yet he takes time to tell us that there was a tabernacle of witness. It is a tabernacle that God gave as a witness among the Jewish people so that they might recognize the Messiah when he came. It is a witness that they have muchly ignored. They had it all the way from the days of Moses, all the way to the time of Solomon. They had David's temple built by Solomon, and then we find all the way down to the time of our Lord Jesus Christ. It was a reminder to them, first in the tabernacle and then in the temple, that Jesus Christ would be coming to be their Redeemer. And yet when he came, 
He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But to as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even them that believe on his name. A wonderful study. Acts chapter 7, beginning in verse 44. Our fathers had the tabernacle of witness in the wilderness, <clears throat> as he had appointed, speaking unto Moses that he should make it according to the fashion that he had seen, which also our fathers that came after brought in with Jesus into the possession of the Gentiles, whom God drave out before the face of our fathers unto the day of David, who found favor before God and desired to find a tabernacle for the God of Jacob. Our gracious Heavenly Father, thank you once again for the privilege of being here tonight to study your word. We pray, Father, that as we meditate upon the scriptures, as we consider all of the different portions of the Old Testament <clears throat> that give us light on this particular object lesson which you gave to Israel, we pray that you will glorify your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, that he would be exalted, that he would receive the praise and the honor, that we might understand more fully how you have given to us in our Lord Jesus Christ the perfect revelation of yourself. We pray, Father, for your blessings on this, your word, that it will go forth with power and clarity, that it will not return void, but that it will accomplish that which you please, and that it will prosper in the thing whereto you have sent it. For we pray it in Jesus' name. <clears throat> now last week, you remember, we looked at the veil that separated <clears throat> the holy place from the holy of holies in the tabernacle, and then later on, in the temple. We saw that the veil is connected to separation from God who is holy and man who is sinful. Even the high priest could only go in on one day of the year behind the veil, that is on the day of atonement, Yom Kippur. We saw that the veil was made of blue, which speaks to us of heaven and the deity of Christ, and purple, which speaks of his royalty and scarlet, which speaks of his sacrifice, and fine, fine linen, which we have seen, speaks of his humanity, made of cunning work with cherubim, shall it be made. The cherubim, we know, are the angels who stood around the throne of God, the covering angels, karuvim, as contrasted with the srafim, the seraphim, the burning ones. And there were going to be two angels that overshadowed this Ark of the Covenant that was behind the veil. And he goes on and he talks about it and he says, Within the veil, the ark of the testimony, and the veil shall divide between you and the holy place and the most holy, and thou shalt put the mercy seat upon the ark of the testimony in the most holy place. That's one of the key items that we want to look at tonight as we trace it through the Old Testament, as we trace it through the New Testament, is the mercy seat. For it is specifically described for us in the New Testament, and we are specifically told what it was to picture for Israel. We saw last week that the veil was mentioned seven times, and the symbolism was specifically stated. We saw in the book of Hebrews that it speaks of the body of our Lord Jesus Christ. A wonderful picture. When the veil was rent, it was at the time that our Lord died on Calvary's cross. Three times we see it in the Synoptic Gospels, the veil being torn. It's not mentioned in the Gospel of John. And then the book of Hebrews explains to us the veil that is his flesh. When he gave up the ghost, the veil of the temple was torn from top to bottom. There was not even a shred of that very thick cloth, five inches thick, that remained to separate man from God. It was completely rent from the top to the bottom. And the Ark of the Covenant and the mercy seat, which could only be viewed once a year by the high priest, was suddenly visible to all. If you were standing at the east gate and looking into the temple, you would have seen the mercy seat. An incredible, wonderful opportunity for man now to be able to approach God directly through the blood of Jesus Christ. Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look unto him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. 
Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest, that's the holy of holies, by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. And now we move through the veil. Now we move to the inner sanctum of the temple and tabernacle. The holy of holies. And here we find the Ark of the Covenant, the final remaining object in our tabernacle study. There were, of course, many other small objects that we don't speak of, the bowls, the pans, the snuffers, the wick trimmers, the spoons, and so forth. But the final major object that is given great symbolic significance by the Bible is the Ark of the Covenant. Interesting that it's called the Ark of the Covenant. We tend to use that phrase, run it on by, and not stop to think, well, what covenant are we talking about? If it's the Ark of the Covenant, why do suddenly we have access to it where before we did not have access? It was a covenant that we're supposed to have. Why didn't we have access before? What is the covenant of which the Ark of the Covenant speaks? We need to ask ourselves some questions about the covenants. There are many covenants given to us in Scripture. We find each of them is given to a specific person for a specific purpose and a specific sign is attached to each of the covenants that are given in Scripture. There are many of them. We'll mention only a few so that you will get the general idea of what we're talking about and, and where we're going when we speak of the Ark of the Covenant. What covenant is it of which we speak? Was it the Noahic covenant? God did make a covenant with Noah and God called it a covenant. In Genesis chapter 9, after the flood, God spake unto Noah and to his sons with him, saying, And I, behold, I establish my covenant with you and with your seed after you. And with every living creature that is with you, of the fowl, of the cattle, and of every beast of the earth with you, from all that I go out that go out of the ark to every beast of the earth. And I will establish my covenant with you. Neither shall all flesh be cut off any more by the waters of a flood. Neither shall there be any more flood to destroy the earth. And God said, This is the token of the covenant which I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations. I do set my bow in the cloud. And it shall be for a token of a covenant between me and the earth. And it shall come to pass, when I shall bring a cloud over the earth, that the bow shall be seen in the cloud. And I will remember my covenant, which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And the waters shall no more become a flood to destroy all flesh. And the bow shall be in the cloud, and I will look upon it, that I may remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, This is the token of the covenant which I have established between me and all flesh that is upon the earth. We have no question God's making a covenant. You heard it about twelve times as I read through the passage. God speaks of a specific covenant. It is a covenant that God makes with Noah. It is a covenant that God will never again destroy the earth with water. There will never be a flood that, in, that covers the entire earth. God gave a sign of that covenant. And the sign of that covenant was what we call the rainbow, the bow in the clouds. God said, every time it rains, I'm going to remember that I've promised I won't destroy the earth with a flood. You see, probably on many occasions, the earth deserved to be destroyed with a flood. That's why God destroyed it the first time was because of its wickedness, because of the violence of men in the earth. So we move to the second covenant that we see in Scripture here. Is this the Abrahamic covenant? We, we find multiple parts to the Abrahamic covenant. They're given at different points in the life of Abraham, beginning in Genesis chapter 12 and then moving to Genesis chapter 15 and 17 and 22. Now, the Lord God had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. The major parts of the covenant are contained here in Genesis 12, 
in a nutshell as we look at it. But we don't have the entire thing there because God speaks again to Abraham at the point where he actually does what is called cutting a covenant. He goes through some specific actions with Abraham to show that this is a covenant that he promises that he will never break upon pain of death. In Genesis 15, beginning in verse 1, after these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. And Abram said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless? And the steward of my house is this Eliezer of Damascus. In other words, if I die without a child, he's the one who inherits it all. And Abram said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed, and lo, one born in my house is mine heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven and tell the stars if thou be able to number them. And he said, So shall thy seed be. And he believed in the Lord and he counted it to him for righteousness. Now, let me just pause for a second. Paul quotes that particular passage right there. Not the one about the sands on the seashore, but the one about the stars in the heaven. Paul quotes that and he says, he said seed singular, not seed plural. He said the seed that he was referring to there is Christ. God made a covenant with Abraham and it included not only the landed inheritance, it included not only making Abraham's name great, it included not only making him a blessing, it included not only making him a great nation. The covenant with Abraham was the guarantee that through Abraham, there would come one who is called the seed, singular, and that is Christ. We don't have time to go into that tonight, but that is part of this Abrahamic covenant here, which he says, so shall thy seed be. And he believed in the Lord, and he counted it unto him for righteousness. When we have righteousness imputed to us, it is through faith in Christ. In the Old Testament, the one who would come... In the New Testament, the one who has come. Oh, I wish we could talk about that. It will never, we'll never finish the message if we do it. And he said unto him, I am the Lord that brought thee out of Ur of Chaldees to give thee this land to inherit it. And he said, Lord God, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? Now look, we're talking about a specific piece of real estate. There are many people today who do not believe that God has any promises left for the Jews. But God is going to say right here, I'm giving you a specific piece of real estate. I want you to understand that. And it's going to be a permanent deed to you, Abraham. So Abraham says, how am I going to know that I shall inherit it? In verse 8. And he, that is God, said unto him, take me an heifer of three years old, and a she-goat of three years old, and a ram of three years old, and a turtle dove and a young pigeon. I wish we had time to talk about the symbolism behind each of those three or five different offerings that are given. And he took unto him all these and divided them in the midst, that is, he cut them in half, and laid each piece one against another, but the birds he divided not. He laid one on each side. There's a rather graphic picture that we have here. Think about animals being cut in half and their pieces laid with like a path down the middle between them. That's what's going on. And when the fowls came down upon the carcasses, Abraham drove them away. And when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and lo, an horror of great darkness fell upon him. And he, that is God, said unto Abraham, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them four hundred years. He's giving to Abraham a prophecy of the bondage in Egypt. That's many years yet in the future. There's Abraham, then there's Isaac, who has not yet been born. And then there is Jacob. And then there are the twelve tribes. And you recall how the brothers sold Joseph into slavery in Egypt. And later on they came down and Joseph rescues them. And then the entire family is there for 400 years. And it gets worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. Until the days of Moses and the deliverance. They shall afflict them 400 years, and also that nation whom they shall serve I will judge. And we see that in the ten plagues. And afterward shall they come out with great substance, and thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace. Thou shalt be buried in a good old age. Abraham died at age 175. 
But in the fourth generation they shall come hither again, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. And we read a passage from Scripture this morning where God said, I'm going to blot out the name of Amalek from under heaven. And it came to pass. Now here is what's called the cutting of the covenant. It came to pass that when the sun went down and it was dark, behold, a smoking furnace and a burning lamp passed between those pieces. What do you think that smoking furnace, that burning lamp was? God's doing something here. It's not Abraham who's doing it. Abraham's simply watching in horror. The animals have been divided. The birds have been driven away. This great darkness, penetrated darkness that you can't see through. Then suddenly there's this burning thing, this smoking thing that begins to move back and forth between the slaughtered animals. That's the Shekinah glory of God. That's God himself making his appearance as he did in the Shekinah glory on Mount Sinai. As he did in the Shekinah glory which rested over the tabernacle. A pillar of fire by night, a pillar of cloud by day. It's a burning, smoking furnace that passes between the pieces. In the days of Abraham, that was what was called a suzerainty treaty. I know that's a big word that we don't hear ever. But what it means is, I'm making a promise to you that if I break this promise, you can cut me in pieces just like these animals and walk between the pieces. It was something that Abraham would have understood very well. And God says, I'm going to give you the land. How am I going to know I'm going to inherit this land? All right, says God, get the animals, put them together here, cut them apart, and tonight I'll show you. And God cut his covenant with Abraham. In the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates, the Kenites and the Kenizzites and the Cadmonites and the Hittites and the Perizzites and the Rephaim and the Amorites and the Canaanites and the Girgashites and the Jebusites. That's a land, folks, that extends all the way from the Nile River all the way to the river Euphrates upon which Babylon is located. In the entire history of Israel, that promise has not yet been fulfilled. Even in the days of Solomon, where the, the land of Israel had its greatest extent of territory, it did not reach those boundaries. Now, either God is telling the truth or God is lying. There is coming a day when Israel, as a nation, will own the land promised in Genesis 15. And yet there are people who say, God has no more promises for Israel. If God has no more promises for Israel, if the church has usurped all of the promises for Israel, how do we explain Genesis 15? We can't. It means that we have a defective God who does not keep his promises. This will be fulfilled, we discover in the book of Ezekiel, during the millennial reign of our Lord Jesus Christ, where we see that massive expanse of territory being specifically divided up among the tribes and a specific central section divided up for Messiah the Prince. These are prophecies that God promised to Abraham. It's part of the Abrahamic covenant. Genesis chapter 15. We move to Genesis chapter 17. When Abram was 90 years old and nine, the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the Almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect, and I will make my covenant between me and thee, and will multiply thee, multiply thee exceedingly. God is restating here the third time the covenant that he's made with Abraham. And Abram fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with thee. And thou shalt be a father of many nations, neither shall thy name be any more called Abram, but thy name shall be called Abraham. For a father of many nations have I made thee, and I will make thee exceeding fruitful, and I will make nations of thee, 
and kings shall come out of thee. And I will establish my covenant between me and thee and thy seed after thee and their generations for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee. And I will give to thee and to thy seed after thee the land wherein thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession. And I will be their God. And God said unto Abraham, Thou shalt keep my covenant, therefore, thou and thy seed after thee and their generations. This is my covenant. Now listen carefully. Because here is something being added. Here we're going to find out what is the sign of this particular covenant. This is my covenant which you shall keep between me and you and thy seed after thee. Every man-child among you shall be circumcised. And you shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskins. And it shall be a token of the covenant between me and you. And he that is eight days old shall be circumcised among you, every man-child in your generations. He that is born in the house or bought with money of any stranger which is not of thy seed. Verse 17, uh, chapter 17, verse 13. He that is born in thy house, he that is bought with thy money, must needs be circumcised. My covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. And the uncircumcised man child, whose flesh of his foreskin is not circumcised, that soul shall be cut off from his people. He hath broken my covenant. And God said unto Abraham, As for thy Sarah thy wife, thou shalt not call her name Sarai, but thou shalt... Call her name Sarah, shall it be. And I will bless her and give thee a son also of her. Yea, I will bless her and she shall be the mother of all na of nations. Kings of people shall be of her. And the angel of the Lord called unto Abraham, and we've studied the angel of the Lord, a theophany in the Old Testament, out of heaven the second time, and said, By myself have I sworn, this is quoted in the book of Hebrews, by the way, saith the Lord, For because thou hast done this thing and hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, that in blessing will I bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is by the seashore, and thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies, and in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because thou hast obeyed my voice. The sign of the Abrahamic covenant is circumcision. Clearly, the Abrahamic covenant is not the same covenant as the covenant to Noah. The sign of the covenant with Noah which had a different purpose and a different point, a different set of promises, was that God would never destroy the world again by water. The promise to Abraham is a specific promise that relates to the land. The thing that God picks out of the covenant to reinforce over and over again is the landed inheritance. And so we move to the third covenant that is a large covenant in Scripture, which is the Davidic covenant. The covenant God made with David. Here's David. He's finished all of his wars. He's moved to Jerusalem. He's built a marvelous home for himself. And it came to pass, when the king sat in his house, and the Lord had given him rest round about from all his enemies, the king said unto Nathan the prophet, See now, I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwelleth within curtains. David looked at it and he said, You know, it doesn't seem quite right for me to be dwelling in a really nice house. And here's the ark of God. It's in a tent. You see, the tabernacle was still there in the days of David. And Nathan said to the king, Go, do all that is in thine heart, for the Lord is with thee. Nathan hadn't bothered to consult with God first. Very bad policy for preachers and pastors and others in spiritual leadership to go ahead and tell people to go ahead and do something because it really seems pretty good and, you know, we think about it, we think that's a pretty good idea. Go ahead and do it. It came to pass that night that the word of the Lord came unto Nathan, saying, Go and tell my servant David, Thus saith the Lord, Shalt thou build me in a house for me to dwell in? Whereas I have not dwelt in any house since the time that I brought up the children of Israel out of Egypt, even to this day, but have walked in a tent and in a tabernacle. In all the places wherein I have walked with all the children of Israel, spake I a word with any of the tribes of Israel, whom I commanded to feed my people Israel, saying, Why build ye not me in house of cedar? I never did it, says God. Now therefore, so shalt thou say unto my servant David, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I took thee from the sheep coat, from following the sheep, to be ruler over my people, over Israel. And I was with thee whithersoever thou wentest, and have cut off all thine enemies out of thy sight, and have made thee a great name, like unto the name of the great men that are in the earth. 
Moreover, I will appoint a place for my people Israel and will plant them that they may dwell in a place of their own and move no more. Neither shall the children of wickedness afflict them before, as before time. And since the time that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel, that's the book of Judges, and have caused thee to rest from all thine enemies, also the Lord telleth thee that he will make thee an house. And when thy days be fulfilled, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build an house for my name, which is what Solomon did, a foreshadowing of the greater son of David, who will have the temple during the millennium. And I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. He, that is speaking of Solomon, if he commit iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the stripes of the children of men. But my mercy shall not depart away from him as I took it from Saul, whom I put away before thee, and thine house and thy kingdom shall be established forever before me. Thy throne shall be established forever. According to all these words and according to all this vision, so did Nathan speak unto David. And we'll not read the next section, but the next section deals with David's prayer of thanksgiving to God. He says, Who am I? I'm a nobody that you should make this kind of a covenant with me, that you should give a promise like this to me that you would establish my throne forever, that there would never lack a man to sit upon the throne of David. And God kept that promise and that covenant. There was always someone who could sit on the throne of David. And that is finally fulfilled. The one who will be the final throne sitter is our Lord Jesus Christ, who is descended from David, physically through his mother Mary, regally through Joseph, his stepfather. Jesus the King, the promised Messiah. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will perform. This is Jeremiah 33. That good thing which I have promised unto the house of Israel and the house of Judah, in those days and at that time will I cause the branch of righteousness to grow up unto David. The righteous branch, as you know in Scripture, and we don't have time to discuss all of that, found both in Isaiah and Jeremiah, is a prophecy concerning our Lord Jesus Christ. He shall execute judgment and righteousness in the land. In those days shall Judah be saved, and Jerusalem shall dwell safely. And this is the name wherewith he shall be called the Lord. That's Jehovah, Yahweh, all capitals, L-O-R-D. Jehovah, our righteousness. For thus saith the Lord, David shall never want a man to sit upon the throne of the house of Israel. Here's the restatement of the promise in the prophets long after the days of David. Neither shall the priests, the Levites, want a man before me to burn offerings and to kindle meat offerings and to do sacrifice continually. And the word of the Lord came unto Jeremiah, saying, Thus saith the Lord, If ye can break my covenant of the day and my covenant of the night, that there should not be day and night in their season. And we didn't mention this, but that's the creation covenant. Then also may my covenant be broken with David my servant, that he should not have a son to reign upon his throne. And with me, the Levites, the priests, my ministers... As the host of heaven cannot be numbered, neither the sand of the sea measured, so will I multiply the seed of David, my servant, and the Levites that minister unto me. The wonderful promise that we see here to David, the sign of the Davidic covenant, is that there would always be a man to sit on David's throne. You say, how can that be? That would have to be on for eternity. And yes, it will be for eternity for Christ will rule on the throne of David. We are specifically told that in the prophets. So that moves us to the next covenant, the new covenant. And we ask ourselves, well, this Ark of the Covenant, is it the Ark of the New Covenant? That, by the way, implies that there was an old covenant that was being done away with, and we see that specifically stated for us in the New Testament. The scripture actually states that the old covenant is done away with. There are four, four verses that speak of the new covenant, once in Jeremiah, three times in the book of Hebrews. Surprise, we're back to Hebrews. The book of Hebrews that tells us about the Ark of the Covenant. Jeremiah 31, 31, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. You remember, it was a divided kingdom. In the days of Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, the kingdom was divided and ten tribes went to the north and they were called Israel. And the two tribes that stayed with the lineage of David in the south, that is the tribe of Judah and the tribe of Benjamin, were called Judah. 
And so he speaks of the house of Israel and of the house of Judah. And there was a continual warfare, you recall, between the northern tribes and the southern tribes until the northern tribes were carried away into captivity into Assyria. And then later the southern two tribes were carried away into captivity by Babylon. Then we read about the new covenant in the book of Hebrews. Twice in chapter 8, once in chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 8. For finding fault with them, he saith, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. He is making a direct quote of Jeremiah 31, 31. Then we get to chapter 8, verse 13. In that he saith a new covenant, he hath made the first, that is the first covenant, old. Now that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. Now we've already seen several covenants, but none of them seem to fit the pattern that we're talking about here where we're talking about a new covenant. Is God going to say, okay, I've got a new covenant, so I'm doing away with the rainbows? Does God say, well, I've got a new covenant, so Abraham's no longer going to get the promises that I gave to him? Is, is God somehow saying, uh, well, I've got a new covenant, so I guess I'm going to annul that covenant that I made that David would always have a man to sit upon his throne. What is the old covenant that we're talking about? Because we've got an old covenant and a new covenant. Chapter 12 talks about the one who is the mediator of the new covenant. You recall that there was someone who made covenants in the Old Testament. It was God himself. Now we find it's Jesus who is making the new covenant. He, of course, is God. Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of the sprinkling, that speaketh better things than that of Abel, which was the very earliest sacrifice that we find in the scripture. There's going to be blood. There's going to be a new covenant. It's a covenant that will do away with the old covenant. If there's an old covenant that's being abrogated, what was it? Well, for for the sake of time, because we're almost out of it. The Old Covenant is the Mosaic Covenant, the covenant of the law at Mount Sinai. How do we know? Well, let's first of all start by asking ourselves, we're talking about the Ark tonight, what was in the Ark? Remember, all of this is pointing us toward Jesus. Everything that we see about the tabernacle is pointing about things to come. What was in the Ark? The first thing that we see in the ark, the very first thing that was put into the ark, were the tables of the law, what we call the Ten Commandments. The second thing, as we discovered from the book of Hebrews that was in the ark of the covenant, was the pot of manna. Some very interesting, significant things about that. Not merely that Jesus is the bread come down from heaven, we've already studied that when we looked at the table of showbread. But the pot of manna was God's very special provision day by day through the wilderness wanderings of the people as long as they followed the tabernacle over which rested the Shekinah glory of God. God provided for them. God met their needs. But they still didn't have direct access to God. But God, because he had a promise, because he had a plan, because he was fulfilling that plan, he provided for them every day until they came into the land and after the first harvest the manna stopped. Supernaturally for 40 years every morning they got up, collected enough for the day, ate it through the day, and then the next morning had to collect more and if they kept it overnight it got worms. Oh, there's so much I want to talk about here, but let's uh, stop for just a moment. The three things, the third one was Aaron's rod that budded. Now we're not guessing about what the Old Covenant is and what the New Covenant is because the Scripture tells us what the Old Covenant is. It tells us what God was abrogating with the death of Christ and with the fulfillment of the sacrificial blood of Christ shed on Calvary for us. We don't have to guess that we're talking about the Mosaic Covenant because, let me read you the rest of what goes on in Jeremiah 31. Starting in verse 31, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which, which my covenant they break 
though I was an husband unto them, saith the Lord. What covenant did God make with Israel when he took them by the hand and brought them out of the land of Egypt? It was the covenant of Sinai. It was the covenant of the law. It was reminded to Israel of that covenant because inside the Ark of the Covenant were the Ten Commandments, the words of the covenant that God had made with Israel. But that was a covenant of death. It was a covenant of judgment as we've already seen. There had to be something so that the children of Israel, when they sinned, did not get killed immediately. And it was the blood of the sacrifices which speak to us of Christ, our Passover lamb, our sacrifice, whose blood is shed for us, 1 Corinthians 5. It was that blood that turned aside the wrath of God that should have fallen because they broke God's covenant. They broke the law. It's the covenant of Moses, the covenant of Mount Sinai, the Ten Commandments that were inside the ark. He's making a new covenant, but it's not according to the covenant that he made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although I was an husband unto them, saith the Lord. But this shall be my, the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. He speaks first of the marriage relationship, how he's a husband unto them. Then he talks about how he's going to give them an internal motivation, not an external threat. And that he will be their God, and they shall be my people, and they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. Has the day come when God has put his covenant into the hearts of Israel and Judah? Well, there are those who like to allegorize it away. There are the amillennialists who say that those promises will never come true. But the Apostle Paul tells us in Romans chapter 11 that there is coming a day in which all Israel shall be saved. And if you read the context, Romans 9, 10, and 11, you cannot escape the conclusion that he is talking about national Israel. He's not talking about an allegorized, spiritualized church. He's talking about national Israel. And he says that there's a day coming in which all Israel shall be saved. It's a day where God fulfills this promise. It's a day at the end of the tribulation, immediately before entrance into the millennial kingdom, whereby Jesus will be sitting on David's throne in Jerusalem as in fulfillment of all the other promises. It's powerful stuff, people. And the amillennialists just tend to ignore it and spiritualize it away. But these are promises from God which he will never break. And God gives us a sign of that. He says, Thus saith the Lord, if the heaven above can be measured, and the foundation of the earth searched out beneath, I will also cast off all the seed of Israel for all that they have done, saith the Lord. Can you measure the heavens? They keep going and going and going and going and our greatest electronic telescopes can't reach out there and all the spacecraft that we've sent out and they're looking deep into the heavens. They continue to see more things and more things and more things and more things and they can't measure it. And it appears to be getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Guys, you can measure that. I'll break my covenant. Is God ever going to break his covenant with Israel? Is he ever going to break that new covenant that he has promised? We move on and we look back into the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 8 again. Who serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things, speaking of the tabernacle, as Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle. For see, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern showed to thee in the mount. But now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry. And now we're speaking of Jesus. It's in the context of Jesus fulfilling all of those types and pictures and symbols that we saw in the tabernacle. 
But now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant which was established upon better promises. Folks, don't try to put yourself back under the law. We have a better covenant. It's established upon better promises. It's a covenant of blessing. It's not a covenant of cursing. It's not a covenant of judgment. It's a covenant of God's outpoured mercy and grace. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. For finding fault with them, he saith, Behold, the days come. Here we are, back in Jeremiah 31, 31. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord, for this is my covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. Here we have it again. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts, and I will be unto them a God, and they shall be unto me a people. And then we get down to verse 13, which we read a moment ago. A new covenant, he saith, he hath made the first old. Now that which is decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. Let me give you the context of that quote that I gave you out of Hebrews chapter 12, because it tells us once again that this covenant we're talking about as the old covenant is the law at Sinai. For you are not come unto the mount that might be touched, and that burned with fire, nor unto blackness and darkness and a tempest, and the sound of a trumpet and the voice of words, which voice they that heard, entreated that the word should not be spoken to them any more. And we'll see this when we get farther into the book of Exodus, as the people come to the foot of Mount Sinai. All of those things that were mentioned here in Hebrews are things that happened at Mount Sinai. For there could not endure that was for they could not endure that which was commanded. And if so much as a beach touched the mountain, it sh he shall be stoned or thrust through with a dart. And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, "I exceedingly fear and quake." That's not what you've come to. Dear people, Sinai is not for the church, but you are come unto Mount Zion and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn which are written in heaven, and to the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect, which he's just described in the preceding chapter in Hebrews chapter 11. And to Jesus, listen, verse 24, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel, See that ye refuse not him that speaketh, for if they escaped not, who refused him that spake on earth, when the mountain smoked and trembled, and Moses said, I do exceeding fear and quake, and that was Moses. The rest of the people ran away in terror. Remember how God judged there? For if they escape not, who refused him that spake on earth, much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven. This is one of the five major warning passages in the book of Hebrews. Not for loss of salvation, but for loss of heavenly rewards and chastening under the hand of Almighty God. Whose voice then shook the earth, but now he hath promised, saying, Yet once more I shake not the earth only, but also the heaven. Now listen to verse 27. And this word, yet once more, signifieth the removing of those things that are shaken as of things that are made, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. It all shook at Mount Sinai. It all shook at the giving of the law. But the shaking things are the things that are being removed. The thing that does not shake is the thing that is established forever. Wherefore, let us re receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace, not law, let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. He doesn't say let us have grace whereby we may go out and do our own thing. He says let us may have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. The abrogation of the law is not an excuse for libertine living. It's as we have said before, and I hope you heard me when I said it. 
Sunday morning services. Living under grace gives us far more responsibility and far more empowerment than living under the law ever did. Living under grace gives us a new motivation for serving God. Not the motivation of fear of death, but the motivation of love for Christ. Love always goes farther in its service than the law requires. When you live under grace and when you truly love Jesus Christ and he is the focus of your life, you will want to do more for him than the law ever demanded. Different motivations and a different spirit of living, living in joy and peace instead of in fear and trepidation. But he tells us, if you don't want to live that way, he reminds us that our God, verse 29, is a consuming fire. The sign of the Old Covenant was the Ten Commandments, the stone tables of the law which were carried around in the Ark of the Covenant. Are we talking about the covenant of Noah? No. No rainbows in that covenant, in that Ark. Are we talking about the David? No, they didn't put the throne of David inside there. We talk about the covenant of Abraham. No, there was not dirt in there that came out of the promised land. We're talking about the covenant of the law because that's the point at which God gave the law and told Moses to build the tabernacle and put the Ten Commandments inside it. The ark. Only the high priest could approach it one day per year. The high priest, of course, as we know from Hebrews, speaks of Christ. The ark was covered by a pure gold lid. It's called both in the Old Testament and the New Testament, the mercy seat, where the blood of the atonement was sprinkled, speaking of the blood of Christ. It was an ark that was overshadowed by the two cherubim of gold, a reminder of the angelic beings who were present at the giving of the law. Did you know that? In fact, in just a few verses in Acts chapter 7, Stephen is going to mention the fact that it was through the disposition of angels that the law was given. Let me read you just a brief description of that ark. Exodus 25, verses 17 and following. And thou shalt make a mercy seat of pure gold. Two cubits and a half shall be the length thereof, and a cubit and a half the breadth thereof. That's 45 inches long. 25 inches wide, so it was nearly 4 feet long and just a little over 2 feet wide. You're going to make it uh, with the cherubims of gold, of beaten work thou shalt make them, in the two ends of the mercy seat. And make ye one cherub at one end and the other cherub at the other end, even of the mercy seat shall you make the cherubim on the two ends thereof. And the cherubim shall stretch forth their wings on high, covering the mercy seat with their wings. And their faces shall look one to another. Toward the mercy seat shall their faces of the cherubim be. And thou shalt put the mercy seat above upon the ark. And in the ark thou shalt put the testimony that I shall give thee. We know what's in the ark. What was the testimony? What was the witness? And it was a witness against Israel. It was the Ten Commandments. It was the law on stone. And there I will meet with thee, and I will commune with thee from above the mercy seat. The law was under the mercy seat. God would commune with man above the mercy seat when the blood was spilled on the mercy seat. It's interesting. That's the Day of Atonement. The word atonement, kafar means a covering, a covering. Our sins were only covered until we came to Jesus Christ. Oh, there's so much more, but let me just read you a couple of other verses. One out of chapter 26, one out of 37. Thou shalt put the mercy seat upon the ark of the testimony in the most holy place. It's a reminder of where this occurs. You're in the presence of God. The most holy place. And he made the mercy seat of pure gold. Imagine how much that weighed. We're told how wide it was. We're told how long it was. But we're not told how thick it was. Otherwise, we could calculate 
what the mercy seat would weigh. But it was something that was clearly not very flexible, and it was solid gold. I mentioned a moment ago the angels. Psalm 68, 17, the chariots of God are 20,000, even thousands of angels. Now listen to the last phrase. David is giving this to us and telling us what was going on at Mount Sinai. The Lord is among them. Among what? The angels of God. As in Sinai, in the holy place. It'll help us understand what Stephen says a few verses later here in Acts chapter 7. The Shekinah glory is composed of God's holy angels. It tells us that God himself is among them. As at Sinai, where the giving of the law took place, and the mountain smoked and it flamed and it burned and it shook as God descended upon the mountain. But not only at Sinai, it says, as in the holy place. That's the holy of holies, where the Shekinah glory, composed of these seraphim and cherubim, hovered over the Ark of the Covenant. Magnificent. We don't have to guess at it. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 2. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received the just recompense of reward... He's talking in chapter 2 there about the giving of the law. The angels were proclaiming this. And anybody who broke it would get nailed. Here's the verse from Acts 7 that I told you about. It's verse 53. Speaking to the Jews, he says, You who have received the law by the disposition of angels and have not kept it. Hebrews chapter 12, 22, But you are coming to Mount Zion, unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels. Fantastic. We've broken through the barricade that God has set around, but we've broken through not in our own strength. We've come through his heavenly hosts that guard his throne by the blood of Christ sprinkled on the mercy seat. Of course, there was manna in the Ark of the Covenant, and we know what that is. Psalm 78, 25, it's not some kind of little plant that grows on the ground in the Middle East. There have been all kinds of speculations as to what this was. We don't have to guess. The Bible tells us specifically, man did eat angels' food. He sent them meat to the full. Psalm 78, 5. The manna that came down from heaven is the food that angels eat. Can you imagine eating that for 40 years? 40 years. Angels' food. And they complained about it. How often we complain about the good and gracious gifts that God gives to us. We find the fire of the Shekinah is described for us in Psalm 104.4 and also quoted in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 7 who make of his angels spirits, his ministers of flaming fire. That's the seraphim, the burning ones. Hebrews 1, 7, and of the angels he saith, and here he quotes Paul writing the book of Hebrews, I believe. He quotes Psalm 104, 4, who make of his angels spirits and his ministers of flame of fire. You see, all the way through the book of Hebrews, he takes us back to the tabernacle to show us how it points to Christ. Now we get to the mercy seat, that lid on top of the ark. Here we come to the doctrine of propitiation. Propitiation deals with the turning aside of the wrath of God. You see, we deserve judgment under the law. We deserve judgment for we've broken all of the Ten Commandments, certainly in our heart, as our Lord Jesus Christ explained the full implications of the law. The man who covets is a thief. The man who lusts is an adulterer. The man who hates is a murderer. There had to be some point at which the divine wrath was turned away from man. And that's the doctrine of propitiation, a big word, but it's in the New Testament. And it is designed to tell us 
that there is something that turns away God's wrath from hitting us instantaneously at the moment we sin. Judgment that we would have deserved under the law. We discover who is our propitiation. He, speaking of Jesus, is the propitiation, that's the word helasmos, for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. This is one of the doctrines of the cross that applies to the non-elect as well as to the elect. Because if it were not so, all of the non-elect would be immediately fried. Only the elect would not be immediately fried when they sinned. And so he's the propitiation, the helasmos, for our sins, not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. In 1 John 4.10, here in his love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation, helasmos, for our sins. But then we find the noun form of that, an extended form called helasterion. And we find that in Romans chapter 3, verse 25. Again, it's translated by the word propitiation, but it's a very special word. Whom God has set forth to be a propitiation, that's hilasterion, through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. That word translated propitiation, hilasterion, is the word for mercy seat is the word for that gold sheet that covered the Ark of the Covenant and the law. For that gold sheet where the blood was sprinkled. You say, well, how do we know that it is? Because the exact same word is used in Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 5. Speaking of the Ark of the Covenant, Paul writes, and over it the cherubim of glory, shadowing the mercy seat, hilasterion. Exactly the same word used of Jesus Christ, who is our propitiation, and whose blood has been spilled and sprinkled upon the mercy seat in Romans chapter 3. In a very real sense, the mercy seat is the throne of grace also because it covered the law of condemnation. It is that place where we can find God's grace because of the shed blood of Christ. Hebrews 4.16, let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain what? Mercy. Remember the mercy seat? The hilasterion, the mercy seat, for us is our Lord Jesus Christ. And as he died on Calvary's cross, the blood of Christ was sprinkled on the mercy seat. He himself, as the blood poured from his body. He is our hilasterion, our mercy seat. He's the one from whom we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. No longer was it a place unapproachable. No longer was it a place whereby even if the high priest didn't do exactly right, he himself would be killed. But now it is an accessible throne of grace. We can approach the very throne of God because the blood of Jesus is the final sacrifice for sin. And something else very interesting. You remember I told you that the Day of Atonement means the Day of Covering because atonement is the Hebrew word kafar, which means a covering. But no longer are our sins covered. Our sins are now taken away. Christ has appeared to take away our sins. They're not merely covered anymore. Hebrews 9, 24 and following, For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. We're back in the tabernacle nor yet that he should offer himself often as the high priest entered into the holy place every year with the blood for, of others. For then must he have often, that is Christ, have often have suffered since the foundation of the world. And that's a blasphemy still perpetrated by the Roman Catholics. The sacrifice of the Mass, they say it has to be often. Perpetual sacrifice of the Mass going on all the time all around the world. Jesus being re-sacrificed. The scripture denies that. 
It says, then he must have been often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Not merely to cover it, but to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment, so Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. One other related word is found in the book of Hebrews. Wherefore in all things it behooved him to made, be made like unto his brethren, that is, Jesus took on flesh and blood as we have, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest. Here we have the picture again of the high priest of the Old Testament moving about the tabernacle to make reconciliation. Hilaskamai. That's related to the throne of grace, to the mercy seat, making reconciliation between God and men for the sins of the people. What wonderful promises, what wonderful blessings are ours as we look back at the tabernacle and as we see the fulfillment in the person and work of Jesus Christ. The Ark of the Covenant which contained the law, the old covenant, the condemned. The mercy seat with the blood sprinkled upon it reminding us of a new covenant that God would make. A covenant through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. A covenant whereby not merely our sins were covered but whereby our sins are taken away. Whereby we are no longer under condemnation but now have a new living relationship with our heavenly bridegroom whom we love and whom we serve not out of fear but out of love. Now empowered not by the flesh but by the Holy Spirit of God who lives inside of us. For there is now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. Christ fulfilled the law. Christ brings us to himself and we are in Christ and he is in us. And now our new motive, our new ability is by the grace of God through love for our Savior. Gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you for Jesus who is our mercy seat. Oh Father, how we thank you for the blood of Christ. As of a lamb without blemish and without spot, verily foreordained before the foundation of the world. How we thank you for the new covenant. The old covenant waxing away and vanishing. The new covenant under which we live by grace through faith and with hearts filled with gratitude and thanksgiving with love for the one who bought us with his own blood in Jesus name Amen